Hello, my name is Diane Southerd. I own Your DNA Guide, and I'm here to tell you about what to do with your DNA test results in 2022. Now you'll notice this is part one of a three-part series, so you'll want to make sure and look for and watch all of these videos so you'll know exactly what to do with your DNA in 2022. So those three parts are going to consist of this uh, part talking about getting started with your DNA test results. Part two will teach you how to dig into your DNA matches. And then part three, we'll talk about what's next, some DNA strategies for 2022. So without further ado, let's jump into part one. So in part one, we need to get started with your DNA test results. But there's a lot of DNA testing companies out there and a lot, lots of kinds of DNAs, DNA tests you can take. So really, I wanna start by defining what we're gonna talk about. So when I say DNA test results, I mean autosomal DNA, which is DNA you received from both of your parents. And I'm talking about results you may have received from one of these five companies. So these five companies are who I consider to be our genetic genealogy companies, which means the purpose of your DNA test at these companies is to connect with and find family. So again, there's lots of different kinds of DNA tests you can take for lots of different purposes but in this talk, we'll be talking about these five companies and their autosomal DNA test results. So when you get started with your DNA test results, I think there are a few things that you absolutely must do uh, when, you, when you first log into your testing company. The first one is going to be navigating these websites. Guys, there's a lot of things to click on. There's a lot of places you can go and it can quickly get overwhelming to the point where you decide you don't really want to know anymore and you leave the website. So I want to just give you some tips about the things that you'll want to look for when navigating each DNA testing company. That will include setting your settings to make sure you have those the way that you want them. We'll talk a little bit about linking your family tree and which companies you can do that at, as well as setting a goal and considering your ethnicity results. So we've got a lot to do here in part one, so let's get going. Navigation highlights. Now, every testing company is going to be a little bit different. So instead of um, trying to go through each testing company and how you do things there, I just want to give you a broad overview, kind of a checklist of the things that you'll need to look for at each testing company, and then some clues about how you might find those things in your testing company. So I want you to be aware that every testing company is going to give you two kinds of results. Results that, that reflect your ethnicity, it's called, or your DNA matches. These are other people who've taken a DNA test that share some DNA with you. You'll also want to be aware of where your settings are found within your testing company, as well as correspondence. Did you know that you can communicate with your DNA matches through these testing companies' platforms? Well, you can, and you need to make sure you know where that's happening. And then, of course, we'll want to be able to navigate and find the trees that are housed in each of these testing companies. So, again, like I said, it's really hard for me to teach you how to navigate short of going through each individual testing company. But in general, what you'll find on the DNA section of the website is these two kinds of tests, that ethnicity result and the match page, are going to be displayed relatively prominently. Maybe you'll find them right there on the main page of the testing company. Likewise, in general, the settings are going to be found under your name or your profile name, and that's usually found in the upper right corner of your testing company's website. Also, that correspondence that's so important. So you can talk back and forth with your matches. A lot of times the alert that you have correspondence will also be in that upper right corner. If the testing company is offering you some kind of tree access, you may find that in a menu up at the top of your website. Now, these of course can be rearranged. Um, perhaps when you log into your testing company, you see a bunch of stuff, maybe about genealogy, maybe about pictures, and you don't really see where to go to find your DNA test results. They can always be found in a top menu. So if you're confused, you're not sure where you are in the website, or you're not sure how to get where you want to go, find that menu at the top and look for DNA matches, DNA results, something like that that will lead you to those answers that you're looking for. So I hope this helps just a little bit, like I said, I know it's a little bit tricky, about how to navigate and find the things that you're looking for. But I do want to highlight this correspondence piece. So 
it might be difficult to think of what to say to your DNA match. Maybe you're interested or curious about their heritage. You want to know a little bit more. Maybe you've tried reaching out and you're not getting a response back. First, let me tell you, probably the reason you're not getting a response is not that your match isn't interested, it's that they don't know how to navigate your website. They don't even know you've sent them a message. So keep trying and be patient. You might also want to try how to contact them on other websites like social media. In fact, there's so many tips that I have for you about how to contact your matches and get a better response rate that I've actually written this little guide and you can find it on my website. It's a free download. You can get it at yourdnaguide.com slash DNA dash matches. So if you want to jot that down, hey, I think I'm in the way. Look at that. See, good thing I remember that or you'd be like, I didn't know what she said. The good thing about me being recorded right now is you can just pause me. I'll just wait. I'll wait for you. If you want to even go down that, download that right now, you seriously don't have to wait for me to finish talking. It's not rude to just pause me and do whatever you need to do and then come back. Of course, you want to see the rest of what I have to say, uh, but don't, don't feel like you're offending me by uh, pausing. So that's the first step. Then after you've kind of figured out that navigation, you want to make sure that you're setting your settings. So setting your settings is important because there are privacy and contact settings that you want to make sure are set in the way that you are most comfortable with. So at all of our companies, you have to give them consent to perform the test. I mean, that's why you paid them money, right? So that they could perform a test for you. But there are two different kinds of consent that you sign when you give them your DNA sample. So you have to create an online profile at these testing companies, right? And so the first consent is always, is it okay for us to test your DNA? Well, you have to check yes to that one. But the second one usually has to do with participating in research. Now, research depends on different things to different companies. So you want to explore what that means at each company and know that you don't have to give your consent for research in order to get the results of your DNA test. It's also important for you to know that you can delete your test at any time from any of these testing companies. You can share as much or as little personal information with others as you choose. You don't even have to use your real name if you don't want to. Uh, share as much as or as little information about your family as you want to. Now, we always encourage you to share as much as you're willing to share because I think that contributes to everyone's experience and certainly helps you connect with other people. But just be aware, it's really up to you. You have a lot of choices, but in order to access those, those choices, you need to make sure you're in those settings and making sure they say what you want them to say. There's also a level of contact privacy within your DNA testing company. Now at Family Tree DNA, the testing company, they allow you to see the email address of your match and then you just email them directly. So that's the most open form of contact, but all of the other companies are using some form of email brokering. So what that means is you send a message, but it doesn't go directly to your match necessarily. It kind of goes through the company and then the company sends your match an email that says something like you got a message or a message from 23andMe or something like that. So a lot of the people you're trying to reach just see that as a marketing email from their testing company. They don't even read it. They're just deleting it. So keep that in mind as far as which company you're at and exactly how their contact works so you maybe understand a little better why you're not getting a response from some of your matches. All right, so we navigated, we set our settings. The next part is linking your family tree. So at our different testing companies offer different options for this essentially. So you can create right in their system or upload from another family tree software system that you may have at Family Tree DNA, Ancestry, and MyHeritage. So it's important to think about how to do this. Um, and it, we have some instructions on our website if, if you want to go check that out um, at yourdnaguide.com. But the important part is that you understand why. Why are you linking your tree to your DNA test results? So think of it like this. Here's your tree you've gone back as far as you can go back in your family tree. And perhaps you've hit a brick wall, right? You know who this particular ancestor is, but you can't find anything about his parents or grandparents, which is why you took a DNA test, right? And so when you're looking at your matches, you might be thinking, well, I know this match, 
Ralph is a descendant of my ancestor. And in fact, Ralph knows less about this ancestor than I do. So why is it important for me to add my tree so that Ralph can see that we're connected or so that other people can see what I know? How come this matters? And it matters because the real purpose of your online tree is to help you find and track your best known matches. So your best known matches are people like Ralph, people that you already know your relationship to. We go over this really extensively in my DNA skills workshop, and I'm going to give you a little more information about the purpose of these best known matches in part two of this series. So make sure you're looking for that part two video so we can talk a little bit more about what we do with these best known matches. But like I said, you can find a lot of information on our blog. So if you go to yourdnaguide.com and you go to learn and then to blog, then what you'll see is the search box at the top and you can search for any topic that you want to. You can browse our list of topics, but you'll also want to search for the word through lines. So through lines is a special kind of nifty tool offered at Ancestry DNA that's only available to people who have linked their trees. So go to our blog and check out that to learn a little bit more about why you might want to link your tree to your family, to your DNA results at Ancestry, My Heritage, and Family Tree DNA. So let's talk just a little bit more. And there's some information, like I said, in the blog post about this, but what makes your tree what we call DNA ready? So a lot of times in our trees, we've collected a lot of information. You can think of it like flowers, like a flowering tree. Maybe you've got pictures. Maybe you've got some lines you're kind of researching that aren't verified. Maybe you've got your tree kind of cluttered up with a lot of extra things. What makes your tree DNA ready is to basically get rid of all that clutter. So one of the things I recommend that you do is make a separate tree just for DNA. You can either copy a tree that you already have and then kind of remove all that extra stuff or just make a new tree somehow so that you have a tree that's kind of your bare bones tree. In that tree, I want you to include the name of your ancestor, the dates, including birth and death dates, as well as birth and death places. These are the vital pieces of information that your tree needs in order to be the most useful in your DNA research. Okay? So, once your tree is DNA ready, then it's going to be able to help you with finding best known matches, which remember I said is one of the big purposes of having a tree. So it helps you by using some tools. Um, one's called through lines at Ancestry that we talked about. There's also the theory of family relativity at my heritage. Again, these are tools that I think are important that we're not going to go over right now, but you can search for them in our blog to learn more about these specific tools and why they make it important for you to link your tree to your DNA. So linking your tree to your DNA is an excellent way to get started. You should also definitely set a goal. Now, I know your goal is probably like, well, I just wanna find an ancestor. Isn't that a good goal? And yes, for sure that's a good goal. But you need to make sure that the ancestor is within range, meaning that DNA can actually help you find them. So to be within range, when we're looking at autosomal DNA, which remember that's the kind of DNA we're talking about right now, you need the ancestor you're looking for to be six generations or closer to you. So I like to tell people DNA can help you find your three times great grandparents or closer. But if you're looking for your four times or your five times great grandparents, DNA is just not going to be very good at helping you with that right now. So why do I draw the line at that three times great grandparent level? It really has to do with the kinds of cousins that you can expect to find in the database. So when we get back to our three times great grandparents, you're looking at fourth cousins. And those fourth cousins have to trace their genealogy all the way back to their three times great grandparents in order for them to be helpful to you. So it's just important to help you think about how much genealogy you would need to do on a fourth cousin match to get back to their three times great to help you find your three times great. And to go much farther beyond that is just so much genealogy that most of the time, most people just won't find their common ancestor. 
okay? So another way to think about and set expectations or set your goal is to think about which lines in your family tree should you start with using DNA. Now, most of us have an ancestor we really wanna find. It's that one in our tree that's been so elusive but that doesn't make that ancestor the right ancestor for a DNA search. Especially if you're just starting out, you want to kind of give yourself a leg up by trying to research the ancestor that you're most likely to find using your DNA test results. So let's talk about that a little bit. So first of all, I want you to look at your pedigree chart and ask yourself, do I have any ancestors that were born outside the United States? Okay, so if you have an ancestor born outside the United States, they are not the best research goal. Because in general, our databases are made up primarily of people from the US. Now that's changing, and if you are not from the US, please get your DNA tested and tell all your neighbors, because it's such a wonderful way to connect with people who are descendants of your ancestors who've moved to a different country. But essentially, right now, it's not a good bet. It's hard to find connections with matches because there just aren't as many people tested outside of the country. So if you were going to choose a particular line in this pedigree chart to research, a missing ancestor, which one would you look for? Now, again, I do this all the time in my workshops and courses. I ask a question like this and then I tell you to pause me. And that's the wonderful thing, again, about being recorded. You can just pause me, take a look at this image and really think about it, decide for yourself. What's the right ancestor? Who would I choose? All right, so pause me, decide, and then let's talk about the answer. All right, did you pause me? <laughs> okay, so first of all, we want the generation closest to us, right? We want it to look for an ancestor that's closest to us. That's going to be the easiest way. So here's the generation where the ancestors are closest to us. So of these ancestral couples, which do we want to research first? Well, we want to research the one from the US, right? So if this is your pedigree chart, this is the ancestral couple that you would try to find first using your DNA. A lot of it is, is trying out principles on lines that are easier so you can learn the steps and learn the principles and then you can apply those to your more difficult lines. All right, so that was about setting a goal. And the last thing I want to talk about is setting, um, is about your ethnicity results. So ethnicity results have three different factors that affect what you get. So we have reference populations, fancy math, and timing. So a reference population is just the people that the company is comparing you against. So if the company does not have a reference population from your ancestors area, well, they're not going to be able to tell you that you're from there. So just understanding the reference populations at every company can be really helpful in understanding your ethnicity results. So that's reference populations. The next one is fancy math. So fancy math, I like to use this analogy where we're trying to figure out what did B have for dinner? So let's say she either had a burger or she had a taco. Now at the outset, you might be thinking, well, it's pretty easy to decide what she wanted or what she had because burgers and tacos are so different from each other. We often think that about our ethnicity. Well, I've got a French ancestor and a German ancestor and those people are way different from each other. So the DNA testing company should be able to tell me where I'm from. But the truth is that French and German heritage genetically looks very similar just like tacos and hamburgers, are actually made up of all the same things. Cheese, lettuce, tomato, beef, it's just in a different format. So each of these things that we talk about in genetics are called a SNP. It's just a single change in your DNA. So what the testing company does is they develop these reference populations that we talked about. Let's say at the burger place, they interview everybody coming out and they ask them, did you have ketchup or did you have a whole tomato? And they do this survey to determine what the genetic type of people who have a burger is. They do the same thing for the taco place, all right? So then they have to decide, well, what did B have for dinner? So we have to look at B's genetic values. She's going to have two, one she got from mom and one she got from dad. You can see she has two ketchups. So if we are going to use the reference population data that I show you here with the tacos and the burgers, and we know that B had two ketchups, where would you say that B is from? Again, if you wanna think about it, just pause me for a minute. 
but where would you say B is from? Now you might be tempted to say, well, she had to have a burger because it's much more likely. But all you can really say is that she probably had a burger because is it possible that she had a taco even with those values? Yes. So this is the problem with ethnicity results. It's all about these probabilities. So the testing company says you're 32% German, which means it's most likely they think that you're German, but you also had smaller probabilities for other places. Okay, so you can really think about your ethnicity estimate like probabilities. It's very likely you had popcorn. It's kind of likely that you had lemonade, but the lemonade is still there. The testing company just doesn't report it to you because it's not the most likely scenario. Okay, and that's all based on fancy math. Okay, so reference populations and fancy math are a big part of our population information. We also have timing. So just think about this, like today you're in wherever you are and a generation ago, where were your people or two generations ago? So when these ethnicity results are being reported to you, you have to ask yourself the question, when? When was my ancestor in that place? And our testing companies have different categories of when. Some testing companies report some way, way back information, like way back to prehistoric times. Every testing company reports back to those thousands of years, those percentages and maps all thousands of years ago. Some companies report some hundreds of years ago information and some even report current information about where you are today. So ask yourself that question when you're looking at your results at your testing companies, who, when, and where? are they reporting? Okay, so again, thousands of years ago, every testing company. Hundreds of years ago, reported by Ancestry, MyHeritage, and kind of 23andMe. But each of these companies, again, has their own um, information that's doing things just a little bit differently. All right, so that's reference populations, fancy math, and timing. And again, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about ethnicity results, we have a free download on our website that is a cool little handout that kind of goes over all of these things we just talked about in a little bit more detail. So if you'd like to jot that down, make sure you pause me and jot that down and go grab that freebie. So when you're getting started, these are the things you need to do. Navigation, set your settings, link your family tree, set a goal, and review your ethnicity results. And like I said, this is just part one of a three-part series, so make sure you're joining me for parts two and part three. I hope you found that you understood the things in that video. And if you want to understand even more things about DNA, check out these videos. And don't forget to like and subscribe. And remember, you can do the DNA and we can help.